Hello, everyone. I am Penny Lewis, Executive Director of the Ecological Landscape Alliance, and I'll be the moderator for the webinar today. Today, we explore mobilizing volunteers for invasive plant removal. This is one of the Focus on Sustainability webinars. This series was, series was developed by a group of regional organizations known for their quality ecological education. By working together, the webinar series enables us to expand the reach of each of our individual programs to a broader audience. In case you're not familiar with these organizations, they're all nonprofits and largely volunteer groups in the United States. The regional groups are the Ecological Landscape Alliance, the Chesapeake Conservation Landscaping Council, the Midwest Ecological Landscape Alliance, and Ecolandscape California. If you have any questions for our presenter during the presentation, you can type them at any time during the broadcast, and we'll hold the questions until the end of the presentation. And now I would like to introduce our presenter, Malin Clyde. Malin is an extension specialist in community volunteers at the University of New Hampshire Cooperative Extension and a project manager for the Stewardship Network, New England. She has a BA from Yale and a BS from the University of Washington College of Forest Resources. She's been working with natural resource volunteers for over 20 years, helping to train, motivate, and inspire volunteers to conserve and care for the land and waters in their communities. Welcome, Mullen. Thanks a lot, Penny, and welcome to other people out there. I hope everyone can hear me, and if not, um, to use that chat box, um, and Penny and I will work out any glitches there. And I just want to welcome everybody. And hopefully people are here to, to learn about um, mobilizing volunteers for invasive plant removal. Uh, that's what I'm prepared to talk about. But um, a little bit about me, that's a picture of me in the upper right hand corner. It's always a little weird in these webinars to not uh, know who is talking. So uh, that's, that's me. Um, and I'll have contact information on my last slide, so if anybody has any things they want to follow up with me, I uh, would welcome you to do that and just to be in touch with me. I do work for uh, the University of New Hampshire Cooperative Extension, so I'm based in Durham, New Hampshire. And I'm the community volunteer specialist and have been working with natural resources volunteers here in New Hampshire for about 18 years and before that worked in the Midwest and in the Pacific Northwest um, earlier in my career. I've always worked with volunteers uh, since graduating from um, the University of Washington and the forestry school. I was learning lots about plants and trees and wildlife and botany. Uh, and part of my research assistantship was to help uh, write a conservation plan for a new conservation parcel out in the Seattle area. And I will never forget, having never really worked with volunteers before, I'm not sure <laughs> I've even been a volunteer in, in the past myself, but we called together a, a group of people to come weigh in on this um, conservation parcel and decide sort of what to do with it. And I figured there might be five people who come from this small town, but in fact, at this evening program, about 150 people showed up and ate cookies and brownies and spent their free time discussing what to do with this new conservation parcel, but also signing up to volunteer for different work crews and trails organizations. And it was incredibly inspiring, and I thought, wow, I really like trees and plants and wildlife, but I really like these people <laughs> um, and just continue to be inspired by volunteerism in natural resources and really am motivated to connect more and more people out there um, to, uh, to the environment through volunteer. So that's a little bit about what motivates me. Um, the Stewardship Network New England, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that at the beginning of this presentation just to orient you about um, where I'm coming from right now and uh, an initiative that we have here at the University of New Hampshire. And then um, talk about volunteerism in general and environmental volunteerism and, and share some sort of principles and trends in volunteering that may affect um, all of us trying to engage people through volunteerism. And then finally wrap up with some very practical tips about working with stewardship volunteers and, and point you to some resources that are um, part of the Stewardship Network website um, that we've created to help other organizations and other people working with volunteers do it more easily and, um, and smoothly so that your conservation projects or invasive, invasive plant work days run smoothly and beautifully and you want to do it again and, and we solve the whole problem of invasive species in the world um, next year. 
uh, well, maybe not, but if everybody was lending a hand to help, um, that, that might be the only way it's actually possible. So um, uh, with that, Penny and I were going to experiment um, trying to do a poll for um, to figure out who's out there in the audience. Um, so Penny, I'll hand it off to you and we'll, we'll try that. If it doesn't work, we'll just zip back into the presentation. Penny, do you want to try? Yes. This will take us just a couple of seconds, if you will bear with us. The poll is now open for all attendees to respond. We'll just give it a minute or two so that we can get some information for, for Malin so she has some idea who's in the audience, and then we'll restart. The responses are coming in. Looks like we only have one or one or two, just a few folks who haven't haven't voted, but maybe they're doing other things. So I'm going to go ahead and close the poll and share it. All right. And Hand it back to you, Mullen. Great. Can you see my screen, Penny? I can see the re results of the poll. And um, did you change the presenter back to me yet? I did. Okay. Let me let me go ahead and take, take control again and restart that so you get the prompt again. Okay, yeah, got it. All right. All right. There we go. Can you see that? Are we back where we started. Can you see my screen? Penny? Uh, no, I am still seeing the results of the poll. Hmm. <laughs> well, my screen is showing my presentation. I wonder what else I can do. I guess I could show. Does that work? Hmm. We have a couple of folks in the audience saying they are not seeing your screen either. Okay. What would you suggest? I will, I'll try again to take, take okay. control back to me and then we'll, we'll try it again. Sorry, everyone. Thank you for your patience as we try to resolve this little technical difficulty. Okay, I just got the, got the prompt. How about that? I'm seeing my screen. I'm seeing the main. Are you all still seeing the poll, Penny? I am now seeing the screen. All right, that's good. Okay. Step in the right direction. And okay, great. All right, thank you. Thank you for okay. uh, working through that, and thank you to the audience for your patience. Great. Well, I appreciate the poll because um, otherwise, you're I'm sort of speaking out into the ether. But it sounds like we have a good man who are. Um, conservation professionals and some who are just maybe interested, it could be volunteers themselves, a few people from public agencies and, and landscaping professionals, so a good mix of folks. It's very helpful not being able to see anybody out there in the, in the ether to know who is listening. So uh, I want to just describe a little bit about the Stewardship Network New England, which is an initiative that's based here at the University of New Hampshire. And I'm the project manager from that, helping, helping found the, this initiative based on some issues that I saw out there in the 
the conservation community and those of us um, trying to work with volunteers and train with volunteers, there was sort of this gap um, that volunteerism was a very small part of many, many different conserv or conservation organizations and public lands agencies and towns and watershed groups, but it really was not um, a big part of anyone's mission and it was sort of ripe for a co collaborative effort to help all of us work with volunteers better and also to recruit more volunteers because again it wasn't the main mission of almost any of our organizations um, but I had worked with volunteers for many many years and just saw um, saw that as a real need and we did a bunch of sort of stakeholder work and learned a lot about what the conservation community sort of needed when it came um, to the um, came to volunteers and actually invasive plants were one of the top things on the list in terms of stewardship issues facing our land owners, um, and I'm sure that comes to no surprise of many of you in many parts of the country, um, and uh, people saw volunteers as a way to, um, as, a, as a method and a strategy to um, working on the issue of invasive plants, and I'm certainly a believer in that, and I think at the end of this presentation you'll, you'll, you'll have heard my view on the matter, which is um, I'm very bullish on volunteers as a way to um, engage people, but also to tackle the, the important ecological issue of, of invasive plants. So the mission of the Stewardship Network here uh, is based on um, an initiative that started in the Midwest called the Stewardship Network. It's now called the Stewardship Network Great Lakes. Um, and we're all mobilizing volunteers to care for and, and study our lands and waters. We also have a sort of a citizen science piece here in New England. Um, seems like a great idea, but what's different about the network and why does, at least here in New England, why would we need yet another environmental initiative? Um, and that's basically because of that fact that volunteers are such a small part of, of many of our uh, groups that, that everyone could use some help, when, and whether it's professional expertise or training, working with volunteers, um, and everyone feels like they need to do better stewardship and increase their capacity. Um, but need some help in, in um, working with volunteers. Also, there's been sort of a boom in land conservation here in New Hampshire in the last 20 years. There's a lot more land in, in public ownership and easements to be monitored and all kinds of um, stewardship responsibilities that have increased with this um, increasing amount of land protection. So there's an increasing focus of our conservation communities and towns and, and the state to focus on stewardship and taking care of these lands. So. Because of that, we start, started the Stewardship Network New England Initiative, and we help organizations work with stewardship and citizen science volunteers. And we're um, doing a variety of initiatives that help connect people to conservation lands. And volunteerism is probably one of the, the primary um, vehicle for that sort of um, engagement. So I'll describe a little bit more what I mean by that throughout the presentation. So this is my last slide about the network, and then we'll get into more discussion about volunteerism in general. Um, what does the network do, just in practical, um, practical terms? So we have this collaborative online calendar, and we've existed for two years, and there have been 123 different organizations in New Hampshire, Maine, Vermont, and Massachusetts who have been using the online calendar to post their stewardship volunteer activities, and that could be a training, but most likely it's citizen science opportunities and stewardship projects, and many, many of those are related to invasive plants. So it has a registration system, people can sign up online, um, it has this calendar of events, um, and there's training opportunities for volunteers, again, not just put on by Cooperative Extension, but put on by anybody out there um, working on stewardship. Um, so it's a way, a one-stop shop for those who are interested in volunteering for the environment. They just have to go to this one place. Um, but also, we have a weekly e-bulletin that goes out that shows all the new volunteer opportunities and makes it really easy for people to find out what's going on collectively across the across the state of New Hampshire, but also neighboring areas um, as well. We have some uh, been experimenting with um, sharing tools, uh, stewardship tools, as well as providing expertise on working with volunteers to people trying to organize volunteers, and really things that cross boundaries. So it isn't just invasive plants, which certainly anybody working with invasive plants knows that it's an issue that 
uh, does not respect property boundaries. Um, but other issues, um, trails that cross property boundaries, um, you need to think beyond your borders when you're talking about citizen science and ecological um, study that uh, property boundaries are, are sort of irrelevant. So the idea of working across property boundaries on stewardship is sort of central to the things that we work on. So that's a little bit about the stewardship network. A lot of the focus is on the idea of collaboration and, and volunteers. So I wanted to start with a couple of slides that are try to answer the question, why work with volunteers? Um, and uh, there's a lot of good reasons for it, um, but there's, it's a good idea to think about projects, um, whether it's appropriate and whether, um, whether it might not be. And I'll talk a little bit about the trend, some of the trends in volunteers. And when we were scoping um, and planning for the launch of this stewardship network, we were, talked with over 80 organizations in New Hampshire and neighboring states about what are the challenges that they were facing when it came to volunteers. And what we heard most often from almost everyone was that um, they had volunteers, but that, that they were aging. So most of them had been involved for you know, 10 or 20 years with one organization and they were having a very difficult time replacing those folks with new people. And they said, we need help. Um, we need help with volunteer recruitment and finding new people. Um, and we took a look at volunteer trends information sort of outside of the environmental community. Um, and this is something that's going, across, that's going across just sort of all of society that over the last 30 years you can imagine that families have changed and with so many more women working and uh, two, pa two working parents just means um, less time to volunteer. They're just, it's just a big change in society um, in general. And so many of our conservation organizations are thinking of the a traditional volunteer who they've worked with now who are now you know, maybe in their 80s. These are very long-term volunteers. They've been with the organization for a long time. They're very dedicated. Um, they'll often volunteer for you know, days on end or weeks on end. Um, they'll have a very regular schedule. They're usually almost always retired. Um, today that kind of volunteer is getting incre is very rare. And that has to do with just the way we work. Um, we sort of look at our volunteer work the similar the way we've worked in our professional lives. And we want more variety. Most people do not work for the same company or the same organization for their whole career. They move around and that's exactly what people are thinking about in their volunteerism. So people are also very busy. They have a lot of choice because of the internet and they have all these technological devices and they're used to a lot of choice and it's just a very different um, approach to the way they spend their volunteer time. So that's important to keep in mind that volunteerism itself is sort of different nowadays and we have to be um, setting up our volunteer opportunities to take advantage of and work with the way society is today. Um, so we looked at all of our organizations um, in New Hampshire who were trying to work with volunteers, so a lot of land trusts, etc. And many of them were um, promoting their volunteer opportunities with a link that says something like, interested in volunteering? Call Sue. Uh, and the question is, well, of course, why isn't that working for them? And one observation is that we're used to knowing everything up front before we commit. And if you go on Google, uh, we, we want to know everything about an event or uh, uh, a um, class or a place that we want to visit or a hotel that we want to reserve. We want to know everything about it, including, including 12 pictures and where it is on Google Maps and how much other people have paid for it um, before we commit to it. And the same has to be said for a volunteer opportunity vagueness, just come and volunteer and be affiliated with our, our organization is really not nearly enough to get most people these days to commit to it. And then the other piece of why it, that phrase, you know, interested in volunteering call Sue isn't going to work is the phone call. Um, and, and that's because these days a phone call is a very, very high bar for many people. Um, they want to be able to sign up for something uh, without interacting with a person. And it's not necessarily a bad thing. We're starting to you know, buy our plane tickets and uh, even order our pizzas without um, 
without actually inter uh, interacting with a person. So it's a little bit intimidating for people if they don't know anything about a project to actually call someone. So again, uh, we need to be um, recruiting volunteers using technology that, that allows people to um, basically uh, make it very easy with a click of a button. So those are some of the things we've learned. Yeah. Excuse me, Malin. Can I uh, just interrupt you for a second? We are not sure. seeing your slides advance. We are just seeing the single slide with the the initial slide with the two photos side oh, by really? side. Oh, that's weird. Huh? Are you seeing this now? Hmm. Did uh. Could you possibly have paused your your view? Hmm. I don't think so. My clock is running. Um, Let me go ahead and uh, and try hmm. try taking taking back uh, control and then passing it to you again and see if we okay. can see your advance your slides advance at that point. Okay. I apologize to all of you for the temporary I delay. Log out of, but I could also log out of PowerPoint. So are you ready for me to change back to you? Sure. Sure. So what are you seeing there? Okay. okay. Now we're seeing why work with volunteers. And if you can try advancing your slide. Okay. Do you see the next generation of philanthropy? Yes, I am seeing that now. Okay, that's good. That's very strange, very mysterious. All right, we're all still with me. So a little bit more about volunteer trends. Thanks, Penny, for, for stopping things. Um, so a little bit more about volunteer trends. The other thing about volunteerism and, and um, societal trends is this idea that one of the biggest biggest um, population uh, booms is in the millennial group, which is people in their 20s and 30s right now. Um, a great pool of potential volunteers for any invasive plant project or any kinds of volunteer opportunities. And there's a lot of attention to the fact that young either donors or future donors to an organization are saying things like, I want to be hands-on, I, I want to help solve problems, I want to see what my potential investment looks like from the inside out. And basically, it's not enough for people to just be sort of affiliated with an organization or to write a check and make a donation uh, or put a sticker on their car. Today's future volunteers are wanting to be involved in a very authentic way. And we think that volunteerism and hands-on volunteerism through stewardship is just such a great opportunity. And you may be thinking about recruiting from this age group. Um, they're really interested in volunteering in authentic ways and not just, um, not just writing a check. Um, so that's a great uh, potential source of, of volunteers for, um, for any kind of um, stewardship projects and particularly invasive plant work. Um, so, great way to engage people in your mission or in your project through, through uh, hands-on work. I would say one cautionary tale is organizations that advertise um, something as a volunteer opportunity but are really just trying to get publicity or educate folks about an issue or raise awareness but they might be describing it as a volunteer opportunity. And I can think of an example that I saw last year um, about a, an opportunity to help come stock trout in a st local stream. And it was described as a volunteer opportunity. And so they got, I don't know, 15 or 20 people to come uh, meet at the stream. And, and there were two buckets in somebody's truck with um, fish fry in them. And you know, it took about two seconds to <laughs> dump the fish fry in the stream. And the problem that I have with that is that most people are thinking they're coming to lend a hand. And when in fact it's just an opportunity to maybe learn about fish stocking or trout conservation. I mean, those are all great things, but people who are coming to volunteer really want to be useful. 
and it's really disingenuous to be um, confusing the two uh, volunteer work and an educational opportunity. So the ideal projects are win-win. There's something in it for the volunteer. They're getting, they're doing actual work. Um, they're, they're, they're actually doing work on behalf of an organization. Um, so it's just really important to be making sure that it's authentic um, work that needs to be done and also that you're providing, um, uh, you're getting something out of that as well. Um, the ideal project, I like to think of the ideal stewardship volunteer project as something that can't be done any other way because of course it was apparent to everyone coming to that trout stocking event that one biologist could have stocked those fish in about 30 seconds. Um, and so it's just really uh, good to think about um, the purpose and um, whether volunteers are the right way to go. Um, and, and of course invasive plant projects um, are perfectly fit into the category of things that have a big geographic scale or need to be um, treated repeatedly or on, in an ongoing way. Um, obviously the problem of invasive species is really big and covers a big geographical scale and usually a one-time treatment isn't going to work. So invasive plant projects are really perfectly suited to involving volunteers because you're never going to have the idea that you weren't actually useful if you come to volunteer for pulling invasive plants. It's very, very clear that uh, it's really hard to do it any other way, especially um, not using chemicals. So one, one note, I've talked with many people who've tried working with volunteers and thought it was not worth their time. Um, and I think it's just important to remember that there is a cost benefit um, that you have to think about because there's, there is a, quite a bit of a investment of time in working with volunteers, mostly in the planning up front. If you do all the planning really well, then the actual event can go incredibly smoothly and everybody's inspired and energized and you get tons of work done. But there's a ton of work that has to be done before that day happens. And if you don't invest that time and you end up planning and not re recruiting enough people, for example, and four people show up and half of them forget their tools and you haven't thought to bring any, and you know, then you end up, um, or people start asking you so many questions and you're focused not on them and you're focused on getting the work done and you realize you can't, you can't do what you were thinking you were doing, um, you might come off thinking that volunteers are a big hassle. Um, so you can't, it's really common for people to think of volunteers as free labor, but anyone who has worked with volunteers knows that it's absolutely not free labor, <laughs> um, that there is a, a real investment of time that, that needs to be put in to make everything run smoothly but they can help you achieve a lot more than you would ever be able to do um, with paid staff or with just a few enthusiastic advocates. So um, it's just important to, to think, um, think about are you willing to, to make that investment. So this is my main point today. If you forget, if you, um, forget everything, but just remember this, um, that if you've not worked with volunteers yet to do invasive plant work, they love it. It's really satisfying in almost every case. I can't think of a single case where um, I've been out with volunteers doing any kind of invasive plant work except maybe multiflora rose, which is just so prickly and horrible that nobody has fun doing it. <laughs> um, but for the most part, um, it's really satisfying work and it's really what this kind of work, this hands-on, outdoors, somewhat hard work is what people picture when they say to themselves or say to you, I really want to volunteer for the environment. Um, in my town in New England, people who say, I want to volunteer for the environment, they end up being um, recommended or placed on the local conservation commission and they end up going to monthly meetings and voting on site plan review and, and policy, town policy. And while that's obviously really needed and okay for some people, most people when they think of volunteering for their environment are thinking about this kind of outdoor <laughs> work um, and sort of literally helping nature. I also just think there's many, many more people who'd be willing to help out occasionally outside in nature than will be willing to come to meetings. So I just think it's a huge opportunity to involve more people in stewardship and conservation through volunteer uh, projects. So the more volunteer projects we have, I feel like the more um, engaged our communities are going to be in helping the environment. 
So another aspect of working with volunteers, um, many of the groups that we work with are private conservation groups, land trusts, et cetera, who are used to, um, their, their constituents are usually donors and people who are you know, committed to conservation for conservation's sake, um, which is awesome. Um, but I would argue that um, sponsoring volunteer projects can attract a much wider audience than just sort of donors and people who are passionate about the environment. Um, we've seen um, new conservation audiences here in New Hampshire might we not, might not be the most uh, racially diverse uh, place, but you know this picture here shows what I consider a, a very diverse uh, audience in terms of non-conservation folks. Um, there there were tons of families. There were a group of um, local high school students who were looking for a serv service learning opportunity. Um, there was a church group that came that again just wanted to help their community. Uh, there were a couple of people who were volunteering as part of their work. They got um, time to volunteer. So those are all categories of people who wouldn't necessarily join a conservation organization but would love to go spend a couple of hours outdoors um, volunteering just basically for their community. So great audience because, of course, most of these people probably didn't even know what an invasive plant was. Um, so these are people who are going to be new to your cause and um, they're going to have fun, they're going to learn something new, and they don't really have to have deeply cared about the issue beforehand. Um, but afterwards, I can guarantee they're never going to forget the plant that you were tackling. Um, so those are you know, 20, 25, 30 more people who know how to identify that invasive plant. So such a great opportunity for conservation and, and invasives uh, as a topic in general. So getting to some of the more practical elements of working with volunteers, um, the next slides will just be talking about um, some things to keep in mind either in planning for your invasive plant work or your stewardship work day or to, um, in executing it, so what to do during that work day. Um, and all of this is available on the Stewardship Network's New England's website. Um, you can download it, it's free. Um, and we sort of compiled these tips both based on the literature but also based on our experience in working with natural resource volunteers here in New Hampshire um, and this tips for working with stewardship volunteers. So we've just found that um, sharing some of these best practices, things we've observed in work days where things haven't gone well, <laughs> um, you can tap into the lessons learned. Um, so I'll just go over a few of those tips in the, in the next few slides. So I think I mentioned it before, being organized is really important um, and starting early. Um, it's not just a, a day of event kind of thing. You really have to plan ahead, um, certainly to recruit people, but also um, just to be um, finding the right site and identifying the logistics ahead of time. Um, but certainly the recruiting of the volunteers is, um, is what really takes time and is really the reason to start ahead. Um, so we look a lot at target audiences. Um, the example shown here on the screen is for a volunteer workday that we've been doing with the University of New Hampshire on actually UNH land. Um, the understory of the forest, which is an exemplary natural community of the Hemlock Hardwood Pine Forest, has one area that has a complete understory of glossy buckthorn. And we've been working for five years now with huge numbers of volunteers from the student body to um, pull invasive plants with using weed wrenches, um, pulling the glossy buckthorn. It's made a huge, huge impact on the forest. We think another couple of years, and we actually will have eliminated that from the understory of most of the, um, of most of the five acres where it's been infested, and it's really uh, made a huge, huge impact. Um, but we do very targeted um, advertising and try and get classes involved and uh, reach beyond. This is not really regular uh, conservation volunteers. This is looking at college students as a, as a volunteer uh, audience. And they've been amazing on Earth Day. We've sometimes gotten 75 kids out there just to come for a couple of hours in, on a property that is right next to their school. So you, put out, you, you get out of it what you put into it in terms of marketing your volunteer event. And there's lots of ways to do that, um, you know, using tips from marketers to get the word out. I think that um, based on that example before of the 
uh, recruiting volunteers for an event that where you didn't really need the help. Um, so that fish stocking um, example. There is um, something to keep in mind about focusing on investing in the relationship of the volunteers who come to your event. And that's really keeping in mind that their time that they're giving <laughs> to you who are organizing the event is really incredibly valuable. It's their free time. They could be doing anything with that. And you really need to focus on not just getting all the buckthorn removed from X, X site that you're working in, but really making sure that the volunteers who come to your event are happy and they're getting out of it what they're, they were hoping. I'll talk a little bit about volunteer motivation and what our understanding of that in a second. But ideally, you want everyone who comes to a volunteer workday to want to come again because then your recruitment job over and over for your projects just gets easier and easier. So that's, I, I, that's why I say invest in the relationship, not just your work for the day. Um, and volunteers are not necessarily motivated by the same thing as professionals or uh, passionate advocates. Um, so professionals might be, their goal is to eliminate glossy buckthorn from college woods. Um, and a passionate advocate might be, you know, just wanting to protect native plants or the environment or, or protect biodiversity. But there's a huge group of people out of there who um, are motivated by other things. Um, they're not, not motivated by those things, but they're not even sort of aware of those as issues. And so it's really important to remember what, what motivates your volunteers. So how do you know what motivates your volunteers? Well, the good news is <laughs> um, lots of people do surveys and ask people um, what, what, why they came. Um, so I've been doing that for many years. So I'll go to a work day and I'll, I'll say, why did you come? I spend the whole time talking to the people who are working um, and say, you know, what are you getting out of this? And the best thing that I can hear at the end of a volunteer event is, this was so fun. When can I do this again? And that, that's what keeps me coming back. And that, that shows that you had a successful event. People are not, they might be exhausted, but they're also totally energized. They had a great time and they want to do it again. Because then you know you've got them. Um, and so the main reasons why, why I've heard in the survey work that I've done with volunteers is that people just want to know that their work is making a difference. And usually they just want to help their community. They love that they're coming to this event as opposed to stocking cans in a soup kitchen, which also helps their community, but they want to be outside, so they love that idea. So make sure that you're, if you're advertising an outdoor event, you're outdoors as much as possible. They also really want to learn something. They might not care even what the topic is, but they want to learn something new. You can sort of see that in their faces when you have a conversation with them and tell them how their work is making a difference. They also are motivated at, with um, learning from professionals. Um, and that, that just means making yourself available. So you're not off doing all the, um, all the grunt work. You're actually spending time talking to the volunteers while, while the work is going on because they're, they're really interested in why you became a professional. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. Um, as you're coordinating volunteers for, um, for this event, either before or after, um, or during the event, your most important job is, um, is working with those volunteers. It's not getting the work done yourself. Um, so your most important focus should be explaining how their work is making a difference. And so just make sure that everybody knows why, um, why we're trying to eliminate buckthorn from the understory of this forest and what, what that's going to do to the forest and how, how exciting that is. And, and how, how their um, two hours is, is going to you know, change the ecology of this forest and how great that is. So that's just really important to remember. It's not just, it's not just grunt work. They are work, working for a higher purpose and, and just let them know what that is. So I just wanted to throw this in there for um, this idea of volunteering on private lands. And it's something that we've come across quite a bit here in New Hampshire. Um, uh, and I just wanted to describe sort of our experience. This isn't necessarily, um, you know, backed up by research, but it's my sense that you have to be a little bit careful about working with volunteers on private lands. Um, and that's just because there's so much um, stewardship need on public lands. And 
volunteers, again, are motivated by helping their community, it's really important to make sure that there's some sort of community benefit if the volunteers are working on private lands. Um, so, for, for example, <clears throat> is the land permanently conserved? That's going to um, help people understand why there's a community benefit to, say, working on invasive plants on this um, property. Uh, we've had some experience and some success having volunteers help with habitat stewardship work um, and invasive plant removal on properties that have a high value for an endangered species. So here we have New England cottontails. Again, I say charismatic because people love cottontail rabbits. They're very cute. Um, and they'll be motivated to help out because they know there's so little habitat left for that species that um, anything we can do on public or private lands to help that species um, keeps people motivated. And then finally, is there public access? I had an experience of someone who did help out on a private, um, private land stewardship project and he said a couple of years later, I've always wondered if I could even go back there. I want to see, I want to see if what we did, I want to see the results of what we did. Um, and if you're working on private lands, it can be unclear, obviously, whether people are welcome to come back. So I think those are just things to keep in mind if you're going to involve volunteers on private land that make sure there is a community benefit and that you can describe that community benefit to the volunteers involved. <coughs> so a couple of very practical tips for executing your volunteer project um, and your, uh, your, work, your invasive plant work day. And we've seen sometimes people forget to appoint a leader or don't make it clear who the late leader is or if there's six people there, who's in charge. Um, that could mean having, um, I always think name tags are a great idea, especially for the leader, so people know how, to, know how to talk to you and know how to introduce themselves to you. Could mean wearing a vest or a special hat. Um, just so people know who's in charge and who to ask questions of. Um, and obviously introducing yourself and explaining who you are. Um, sometimes people forget that and they just want to get, that, get down to work, but it's really important to bring the group together. Certainly to make it fun, it may, be, it may feel like work, but the more you can make it fun, again, the more people are going to have a good time just keeping in mind that this is people's free time. <laughs> so why not make it fun? It really should be fun. Um, Timing, we, because we have this volunteer calendar that we've been working on for two years with over 100 organizations, I see a huge variety in the length of time people are, um, are listing their volunteer events. And I think, I think short is good um, and trying to get as many people as possible in a shorter period of time because people don't want to feel like they're quitting early, but really people get pretty tired of doing outdoor work after about two hours. And so then you have people ditching and then they feel kind of bad and it kind of disrupts the, the flow and people are coming and going. Um, so it's much better if you can keep it short, <coughs> one and a half, two, two and a half hours maximum um, and get as many people as you can and have everybody come and go at the same time. That's ideal. It may work out that you want to have two shifts in the morning and the afternoon or something. But um, don't, don't, don't do an eight hour work day. Um, you're going to have very few people show up. <laughs> Um, people do continue to do it, and I, I don't know how that is possible. I certainly would not um, be able to last eight hours for a volunteer event. Um, it's one thing if you're being paid, uh, but if you're volunteering, you can always walk away, and you want to make sure people leave feeling really happy and like they made a difference and not that they're ducking out embarrassed to be leaving early. Um, this is a hard one, number four, don't leave things half done, but try and plan a project that has a discrete that you think you're going to be able to accomplish, even if it's just flagging off an area of invasives that you want to tackle or saying we're going to do this strip of the forest and make sure people feel like they can, they can see the difference, um, but also that it's not just an unend unending Sisyphusian effort <laughs> to keep, um, you know, keep tackling an en endless um, an endless run of invasives or whatever, um, it's much better if you can sort of set a goal and if they can accomplish that goal then you can move on to the next patch. Um, uh, it's just there's something about um, psychology wanting to finish what we started and, and feel like they made a difference. And finally I say food, it's great if you can make it happen. You can also suggest that people bring it themselves, but people are never, never unhappy to see um, apples or cookies or who knows what, but we almost always try to have some sort of food, granola bars. You can get those donated or um, if you have a little bit of a budget, it's well worth it to make people feel welcome. Let me give it just a few more tips here. Um, I wanted to point out that on the Stewardship Network New England um, website, we've also pulled together a checklist that we use 
um, for our work days and that is available to you. You don't need to bring everything on here, but at least it'll help you um, not, um, not forget something uh, critical. Um, things like we have these weed wrenches that we have, a, we actually have a tool sharing program here in southern New Hampshire where people can check out um, huge banks of weed wrenches from a local conservation group. But we found there's other things that are hard for some volunteers to get their hands on, even gloves. Um, it's funny working with college students, you think, oh, everybody's got work gloves. Well, college students actually don't have work gloves, <laughs> um, and they don't have shovels, they don't have loppers. So when you're thinking about trying to reach out to new audiences, don't assume that everybody has all this gear. So if you can find a local hardware store to donate a bunch of gloves, that's a great way to, again, make your, um, make your volunteer activity open to as many people as possible. You can get that checklist on our website as well. Um, and this is, I think this is my final tip, um, practical tip, and, and that is that people enjoy people. And there's a lot of volunteer activities out there that um, are set up to be sort of <laughs> lonely, solitary work. Um, and that might work for some people. So this might be, you know, mapping invasive, sign up to, to map uh, conservation areas and map invasive plants and let us know when you see an invasive plant on your iPhone. It's really, uh, it's an uphill batter to keep something like that going. Uh, you really have to do a lot of work to motivate people. But boy, trying to organize things around an event <coughs> where you might have a blitz and have everybody together working on some project or you start off your work day, everybody together and everybody you know, goes out from there but then comes back again at the end, you just get more opportunity for people to learn from each other and ask questions and socialize and again spend a little time with a professional. All of those things are going to um, make people more engaged and more excited to come back for another event. So just keep that in mind in structuring your events to, to try and get people able to hang out with other people. And the last thing is, you know, people think that, that you have to load people down with great prizes and swag and t-shirts here. Um, but really, um, in our experience, any kind of thank you is, is sufficient. Again, people just want to be helping their community. If you've made it very clear how their work is helping, you verbally thank them and maybe send them a follow-up email and a photo of them helping out uh, at the event. I mean, that, is, that goes an incredibly long way to making people feel valued and that, they're, that you are valuing their free time that they've donated to you. So, you know, if you have food and t-shirts and all that stuff, that's great, but it's certainly not necessary. Um, it's just being, you know, very polite and respectful of people's free time. It's just as valuable. Or in my case, I feel like my free time is actually more valuable than my money. So just be, be uh, of that. These are just a few things that we're working on here in, in New Hampshire um, and New England. Uh, we've been organizing this garlic mustard challenge. So garlic mustard is a relatively new invasive in New Hampshire. So we've been joining with the Midwest, who's been doing this garlic mustard challenge, recording the amount of garlic mustard pulled from all kinds of work days and natural areas. Um, so we started off last year, pulled 540 pounds, but this year we we're up to 3,800 pounds, and we hope to double that again um, this year. So if you're out there in New England pulling garlic mustard, log into the Garlic Mustard Challenge in New England and, and uh, log in your amount pulled. Um, so that's kind of exciting, a way of sort of showing collective action. Um, we are developing some curricula this year for um, an invasive plant workday 101, how to, how to run a volunteer workday. So we're going to have all of that available online next year. Um, we're training people to how to use EdMaps, which is an invasive plant um, database, national database for mapping locations of invasive plants. But not just mapping them, but tying tying our stewardship uh, efforts to those recorded examples of, say, garlic mustard. Um, map them one year, and then the next year go back and actually organize work days to to pull that plant. Um, and then finally, we're just trying to incre increase the number of volunteers who have joined the network, which is free. You can sort of sign up to get this weekly bulletin because we feel like the more the more new people interested in volunteering for the environment, the more chance we have that every Every volunteer um, workday listed on the network will be full and uh, we'll get as many people as possible um, helping out in their communities. And that's my last slide. It was a few minutes longer. We had some technical difficulties, but again, my name is Malin Clyde and I'm at the University of New Hampshire Cooperative Extension. There's my contact information. I encourage anybody who's interested to reach out. Um, and that newengland.stewardshipnetwork.org is our website. Um, 
and you can sign up to get, if you want to lurk and learn a little bit more about what we're doing here in New England, um, you can um, uh, sign up to get that weekly bulletin. So with Thank that, I think I'll turn it back, back over to Penny. Thank you, Mel, and this, is, this has been very good. We do have a few questions if you have time to address them. The first one is, can you describe some of the tools that you use with volunteers? You mentioned supplying gloves and a little bit about the weed wrench program. Can you talk a little bit more about what other tools you provide? Yeah, I would say um, in some cases, uh, well, two things that I think um, we often forget and we've added over time. Uh, certainly gloves are important. Um, but one is some sort of washing station or a bucket of water, and uh, I usually bring a product called Technu, which is a soap, and that's for, um, people are very cavalier about poison ivy, but the last thing I want is for someone to come to a work day, not recognize poison ivy, even if we try to keep out of areas with poison ivy, New England's just full of it. Um, so I just encourage everybody to wash their hands um, and their arms and stuff um, with this soap wash out in the field before they go home. Um, and that way I just sort of feel better just in terms of, you know, it's not the end of the world if we get poison ivy, but it's certainly not what I want people to remember. So that's something I always bring um, to work days. And the other thing is I think I, I showed pictures of that sandwich board um, that says volunteer work day, and that's something what we've added to our tool loan program because there's nothing worse than people being uncertain if they've showed up to the right place. And many of our natural areas in New Hampshire aren't very well signed. They're a little bit, <laughs> they're a little bit unknown. Um, and so we, we have a Google link for all of our projects that if they're listed on the network, you have to have a, a Google map point about where people are going to meet. But when you're, when you're out there in the field, sometimes it's, people are uncertain. So having a sandwich board that says, everybody come meet here, they'll, they'll be just reassured that they're in the right place. So those are two things that we found are just really helpful in inspiring confidence and keeping people, um, keeping people safe. But I would encourage you to look, look at that checklist. And um, you know, if you have any questions, certainly get in touch with me. But those are the things that we kind of um, have stocked our workday um, you know, supply closet with. Okay, uh, we have a few questions about weed wrenches and and the sharing. What geographical area is covered by the tool sharing network? That's a great question. Um, it's based at the Great Bay Estuarine Research Reserve, which is in Greenland, New Hampshire. And they have about 30 or more weed wrenches. And I think that they'll loan them to basically anyone willing to come and get them and bring them back. Um, and I've had people from um, the Upper Valley of New Hampshire, which is about a two hour drive from the seacoast, um, borrow them because they're the only tool sharing place around. We're trying to work on that and experiment with some different regional models. Um, it happens to be in New Hampshire that um, you know, chemical treatment is um, not very common here and um, pesticide applicator -like licenses are very hard to come by. So people are either not dealing with invasive plants or all, at all or really using these mechanical methods with volunteers. And so maybe sooner than in other places, we've found that having a big, a big um, supply of weed wrenches is really um, important. So it emerged here. Um, again, the link is on the Stewardship Network website, or you can go to, um, if you type in Great Bay Weed Wrench Loan Program, I think, into Google, you'll um, find a, a link to that. Um, so again, if you're anywhere near the seacoast of New Hampshire, um, it's, it's a, a, a nature, natural area run by Fish and Game, uh, New Hampshire Fish and Game, and they loan these out for free to conservation projects and conservation organizations basically anywhere. Okay, one of the follow-up questions was, where can you purchase weed wrenches? And I know that weed wrenches per se, the, the original company is no longer in business, but there is a company that ELA has worked with. If you go to extractigator.com, that's E-X-T-R-A-C-T-I-G-A-T-O-R.com. It's a Canadian company. We actually had a couple that they donated to the ELA conference last fall, and you can order directly from them. It's a very similar tool. They've actually made a couple of improvements 
uh, to the original extractigator, uh, or excuse me, the original weed wrench design. Um, yeah, that's a great point, Penny. Um, I would also say uh, the Great Bay Loan Program um, has also purchased, I think they're called Polar Bears, po not Polar Bear, Polar Bear. Um, so it's another uh, company. Um, so they have a mix of different brands, basically, in that tool sharing program. So yeah, it's not just weed wrenches, because you're right, they're not available anymore. Um, and there's a couple of people are interested in, in other tools. Um, feel free to reach out to me or send me an email, because I, people are starting to tell me about other alternative tools. Um, I'd be happy to share that information, ones that are actually a little different than a weed wrench. Um, just hearing about those uh, this year. So I've not tried them myself, but I'd be happy to share that information. OK, excellent. Uh, this question is uh, along the same lines. Do you ever have volunteers work along a combination of manual pulling and machines that pull the larger shrubs, like glossy buckthorn and multiflora rose, or would you recommend doing those projects separately? Yeah, I tend to s think that separating heavy machinery and volunteers is a good idea. <laughs> and we have done some cool projects using um, mechanized machinery to, to work on invasives. And sometimes we'll hold an information session um, as that person is working, but to try to have the work day and the machinery going along, it's sort of distracting, but also I worry a little bit about safety and it's just sort of, um, I think maybe it could get a little discouraging to see the impact that, that heavy machinery can have. It makes you sort of feel <laughs> like you've just got these two little hands. Um, so I think there's probably a reason to separate those two, but, but certainly to um, try to target the best tool for the job, volunteers are certainly not always the answer. Um, so that would be my gut reaction, but I have not experienced. I have not actually tried to do it at the same time. But I would even just the noise. Um, I find that it's sort of sort of fun and restful to be out in the field doing hand work with a bunch of people. That okay. maybe the no noise of that might be distracting. Okay. Uh, not sure if you'll be able to recall this, but you had a slide earlier, and this question is: What is the white tool that the woman was using? Yeah, um, that's that alternative brand. It's an, of weed wrench. It's like um, it's very similar to a weed wrench, but um, it's available now. And I want to say it's a polar bear, but it, it might be an extractigator. I can't remember. But it, it, again, it's a sort of a, com a competitor to the um, reed wrench. Um, I can find out more. That those are the those are in the uh, tool sharing program of the Great Bay National Wildlife Refuge. Okay. The next question is, what invasive control projects are not suitable to be taken on by volunteers? Yeah, um, that's a great question. Um, I do think sometimes if the, if the invasive plant problem is too huge in scale, it can be discouraging. Um, on the other hand, I worked on a project this fall um, with a very small natural area that backs up to two different schools. And the town owns the property and had sort of given up on it in terms of you know every, practically every plant in there except for the mature trees was an invasive plant. And it just wasn't high on our priority because it was such a small, small piece of land and it was just overrun by you know, 10 different invasive plants. But the school was really interested once they started learning about invasive plants. They were sort of interested in tackling it um, because it was right outside their back door. And then, of course, they have literally hundreds of students who could tackle it for a very long-term project. So, you know, I look at that and say, well, it's maybe it's not a lost cause if you can partner with an organization that wants to do an ongoing long-term ecological restoration project. Um, but I think uh, I think things that are very prickly are also <laughs> pretty unpleasant. Um, so um, thinking about um, Japanese barberry or certainly multiflora rose, it's really discouraging and painful, and you know, it's not 
you know, it's not it's not great, very fun work. I'm not saying it can't be done, but um, it's not great. Um, so I think the the most rewarding plant that I've experienced here in New England is pulling garlic mustard, just because it's so easy to pull, um, and it's really easy to identify, and um, it's one that we're very concerned about because it's an early um, detection species here in New Hampshire. So I want to get as many people recognizing that plant as possible. So we're, we put a lot of focus on that. Um, and again, it's really easy to pull and you can put it in bags and we sort of understand the disposal. And I think people really feel that like they're making a difference with it because it's not, it's not a huge problem yet. Thank you. The next question is a combination comment and question. The uh, participant says, I have a theory that people can get really motivated to save trees from invasive plants. So my focus around free the trees, my focus is on free the trees. Do you think this is something that would help motivate volunteers and have you used this? Oh, that's great. Um, I think that um, it is what you're doing with free the trees is focusing on what you're saving, not what you're getting rid of. And I think that that's just right. Um, whether people are motivated by trees or forests or animals, um, the focus is on, I always try to try to articulate very clearly, again, what it is people's work is saving. So whether that's um, the, this high quality hemlock forest, or it might be, we do a lot of um, early successional habitat work here in New Hampshire because of some of our species that are in decline. So there may not be any trees in the areas we're working, but still to be able to talk about the species, the particularly wildlife, I think people are really interested in wildlife. So talking about how wildlife, um, you know, prefer native native berries or that these are healthier for birds or whatever kind of ecological case you can make for how the invasive plant work is going to contribute to a healthier um, environment and just be able to make that case in whatever way you can. So I think you're definitely right on the right track. Okay. The next question sort of uh, goes back to your earlier question about projects that are perhaps too big to tackle. This one says, many of us face properties on which we don't have capacity to set up ongoing series of work days to accomplish the invasive plant goal, um, but they are looking for folks that are interested in stewarding those properties on a long-term basis. Do you have tips for how to recruit that particular type of volunteer? Well, I think you're going to have... It's it the places I've seen that work, and that's really to have a, a long-term steward of a property. Um, is if you have a a program to train those folks. Um, so the the Society for the Protection of Natu New Hampshire Forests is the largest land trust working in New Hampshire, and they have a very successful program that just that does just that. Has um, one or two stewards for each of their properties. They do have a two to three day training program for those stewards to again build people's confidence, but also keep people engaged and make them part of, feel like they're part of something much bigger. But it does require a pretty significant investment of time um, and resources. So they have a whole staff person dedicated to um, you know working with all of those volunteers across the state. And without that, it is really hard to keep people motivated um, if you don't have a real authentic relationship. So I've seen many attempts at trying to get, uh, you know, adopt a trail or adopt a park efforts going where there just wasn't enough organization and training behind it to keep people interested and engaged um, working sort of independently. So, you know, it might be worth talking to conservation groups who have done that successfully to figure out what pieces of it might be able to be adopted. But it is a, it, it's harder, again, because people are motivated by other people. So those, um, those events are going to be easier. Um, and, and also, thinking about those volunteer trends, people have shorter and shorter amounts of time to volunteer. So breaking up your projects into events um, can be, um, you know, a, a strategy that works for maybe younger people or, um, you know, today's volunteer. Okay, the next is a, kind of a series of questions asking about resources. Um, are there resources that you can recommend that address the best timing for specific invasive plant removal? 
uh, methods for specific plant removal, and most importantly, since many people have asked this question, for the appropriate disposal of all material that you're removing? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I actually think the problem is not that there's not enough information about that, but that there's actually too much. Um, so there's so much information online about different methods um, from different parts of the country. I would say, you know, in my experience, at least right now, I don't think there's a single answer. I think cooperative extension, at least in, in our part of the state, or in our part of the country, are, are doing a lot. They know a lot. They have natural resources professionals that can, um, you know, consult with landowners um, or with professionals working in this area. Um, and, you know, they're going to provide research-based information and links. Um, I think our our state agency in New Hampshire has a very good program in invasive plants, and certainly the Nature Conservancy has been working in the area of nation, uh, in invasive plants for many, many years, um, and they have a lot of great information. Um, so it's hard for me to say there's one magic website to go to. We tend to, here at Cooperative Extension, collate and pull out what we think is the most useful resources for our area. But, you know, again, I would say, you know, the laws are different in every state. Um, and even in New Hampshire, t disposal laws vary somewhat by town. Um, so it, you do have to do some homework um, about what's allowed and what isn't. Um, and it does vary a lot. Um, and, but most, in, in my experience, most people are pretty flexible when you're talking about invasive plants. You're trying to do something good. Um, people will probably, you know, listen and 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 uh, you know try and help you achieve your goal. I haven't found too many, um, you know, bureaucratic snafus when when trying to solve an invasive plant disposal problem. Usually, um, you know, you can find a solution, and people are pretty, you know, they're, you're not you're not trying to dump your construction waste. Um, uh, people are trying to trying to help you solve that problem. So I'm not sure that's a very clear answer, but Good. Well, it's, it certainly makes us all aware that we have to be very well educated before we start the process, and there may not be just one source. The mm -hmm. next question is, do you have any volunteer programs that deal with aquatic invasive removal, and do you have any tips for that? A great question. We actually have a pretty active state agency person, uh, educator and professional who focuses exclusively on aquatic invasives here in New Hampshire. So it hasn't been a niche that we've, um, you know, we certainly advertise those volunteer projects. Uh, we have one here called River Runners. So it's trying to engage with um, boaters and kayakers, uh, people who are out on the rivers and lakes already, and give them the tools they need to recognize aquatic invasives, and then a, a pretty simple online reporting system. Um, so, but there, and then there's various programs, I think, in different lake associations for removal of aquatic invasives. But for us, I think it's more of a watchdog and an informational program, and it's run by the state. So, well, we'll, we'll help mobilize people for those efforts. I haven't actually been involved in doing any training or anything. But okay. I think, yeah. Uh, the next question is, with spring being so hectic for everyone, are there any volunteer efforts that you recommend can be accomplished in late autumn? Yeah, um, I actually think autumn is a the, my favorite time to do invasive plant removal, particularly for um, forest um, shrubland invasives. So, like buckthorn, we were talking about, mainly because there's no bugs in the fall. <laughs> um, you know, people may be a little weary of uh, outdoor work, but it's also really easy to recognize many of our New England forest invasives. Um, because they hold their leaves longer than most of the natives. So, for example, glossy buckthorn and Japanese honeysuckle and burning bush. I mean, talk about an e easy one to recognize in the fall. So we've actually done a ton of fall work days um, on those species. It doesn't work for garlic mustard and, and some, you know, some other plants. It doesn't work for every plant, but, boy, it's pleasant working conditions. And, um, you know, it's not hot and it's... Fall, beautiful leaves, you know, there's a lot, lot of things going for fall work days. Okay, and we have just one, one question remaining. Do you have a minute to discuss the work that your group has been doing on New England cottontail restoration? 
Sure. Um, New England Cottontail in New Hampshire is, we have pretty small areas where it still exists. Um, and uh, it requires, New England Cottontail requires shrubland habitat for, to um, exist. So shrubland habitat in New England is hard to, hard to maintain and hard to come by. So there's been a lot of work to um, either create shrubland habitat out of old fields or to um, remove the overstory species and either plant or encourage native shrubs. But of course, shrubs are, um, a lot of these areas are also invaded by um, some of the shrub species, autumn olive, um, glossy buckthorn, uh, multiflora rose, um, a whole host of invasive shrubs. Um, so we're trying to, as part of that habitat creation for New England cottontail, really trying to keep them off of the federal endangered species list, which has actually just been decided that it has been kept off that list, which is great, um, due to all this intense habitat work, uh, still on the endangered species list for the state of New Hampshire. Um, we're trying to uh, make sure that those shrubland habitats that we're creating for cottontails are not just filled with invasive plants. So often there'll be um, removal of the invasives from an old field and then um, an effort to plant those with native shrubs to give those natives a heads up. We usually can't totally eliminate the invasives, but trying to make sure that the, the habitat that's created is native habitat and not um, just invasive plants. Great. Well, thank you, Mullen, for all of these uh, valuable insights into the role of volunteers and how we can optimize their involvement in our invasive control work. Thank you all for attending. Good day and good gardening to you all.